I wouldn't have said they're that typical, but they certainly are a family and they have the problems of a family because although they have the privileges, they also have the responsibilities. The lower down the pecking order you go is the more reluctant the members of the family are to live up to their responsibilities. Some do it, some don't. We don't know very much at all about misbehavior in the royal family. We only know what gets leaked. And just like in any other family, that's only a percentage of what happens. Harry, for instance, has never been eager to live up to his royal responsibilities. Happy to live up to the privileges, but not the responsibilities. But I think when it comes to family information, the royal family is much more tight-lipped about who disciplined Harry, who knew what about Harry's indiscretions. Welcome to chapter nine of The Firm, Blood Lies and Royal Succession. I'm your host, Jonathan Locke. We've been taking a journey through five centuries of royal secrets, scandals, and cover-ups, and now we're going to turn our attention to the wild youth of a man who, almost from the very start, was not comfortable with his birthright. Harry is kind of known as sort of a loose cannon. They really struggled with how to manage his brand, his independent brand. He would get into physical fights with paparazzi. He would come crawling out of bars late at night and there's all these terrible photos of him clearly intoxicated. So he was just such a harder personality to manage when it came to palace PR than Prince William. The man we know as Prince Harry, the second son of Prince Charles and Diana, Princess of Wales, was born in London on September 15th, 1984, and christened Henry Charles Albert David. The nickname came later, and if Harry was an affectionate reference to the famous 15th century king Henry V, also dubbed Harry, then readers of Shakespeare will know that the comparison turned out to be uncannily accurate. Jacqueline Roth, executive editor of the TheRoyalObserver.com, explains. I mean, the comparison between Prince Harry and Henry V is definitely there to be made. Henry V is immortalized in Shakespeare in three plays charting his life, and in them we see how he grows from this wild, rebellious boy, drinking and partying and womanizing into one of England's greatest soldier kings, defeating the French at the famous Battle of Agincourt. Our Prince Harry may never actually become king, and it is even more unlikely that he will ever lead an army against France. But as we shall see, he certainly had a riotous youth and also found redemption of some sort fighting for his country. Harry seemed to be a born soldier. He was channeling all of the qualities of him that were commendable. Things like valor and risk and putting his life in danger for the greater good. So he had an actual purpose in life. Lady Colin Campbell was close to the royal family from the very start of Harry and older brother William's life. Well, both William and Harry were pretty wild. And I remember them when they were little boys. And both of them were pretty wild. But Harry had a real mean streak. Harry once rode his tricycle, I think it was, if I remember it correctly, into the shins of an army officer who had come on an official visit to Diana, and she reprimanded him, but she didn't punish him. Sally Otnes, author of Royal Fever, also remembers Harry as, shall we say, a lively child. If you look at the old videos of Diana and Harry together, he's a rap scallion. You know, he's running around, trying to bang on the piano while she's got interviews going on with the press and, you know, climbing around. And she's always constantly saying, Harry, Harry, calm down, Harry, calm down. Harry was always doing things like this. And Diana thought that if she said, you shouldn't do that, but there were no consequences. And there were never consequences because she spoiled those children. We are seeing the unfortunate effects of it where Harry is concerned, even more than William, because she at least brought William up to understand that he had the responsibilities. But with Harry, because he was having responsibilities of any note, she brought him up with the illusion that despite the fact that he was never going to have these responsibilities. He was 
equally entitled. And that, in my opinion, and I now speak as a mother, was a fatal error to make. For the short time that the brothers had with their mother, Diana made a point of treating both her sons equally. And according to the strict, centuries-old tradition of how things work in the firm, this was a grave mistake. It sounds horribly heartless to any normal parent, but as far as the firm was concerned, the brothers were not equals. William, simply by accident of birth, will always be more important than Harry. Royal commentator Eloise Parker and Thomas May Sarcher Mills, founder of the British Monarchist Society, explain. When you look at the differences between William and Harry, you have to go right back to the beginning. Prince William's sense of purpose has shaped who he is from the moment that he was presented on the steps of St Mary's Hospital in London as a future king. You're schooled from early childhood on what's expected. It was very difficult for Harry because what his mother did was put him at a disadvantage ever since he was a young child because she treated him as an equal. So, and when I say an equal, an equal not just to his brother in the terms of the number one and number two son, but in terms of the crown. William was a naturally boisterous toddler who was quickly shaped by the weight of expectation into an adult with an almost uncanny level of self-control. Um, he's incredibly measured in everything he does. Harry, by comparison, has had a little more freedom from the beginning. As the youngest child, he was more indulged. The problem that we are seeing now with Harry stems from that sort of parenting that Diana had done. It was always wanting to make Harry feel that he was no less than his brother. But in the terms of the British crown, it is his brother William who is the crown, who is more important, who will be king, and Harry will never be king unless something catastrophic happens. And then, on August 31st, 1997, tragedy. This is BBC Television from London. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. The French government announced her death just before five o'clock this morning. Buckingham Palace confirmed the news shortly afterwards. Normal programmes have been suspended while we bring you the latest developments throughout the morning. Harry was just 12 when his mother died, it remains one of the defining moments of his life. Here's royal commentator Richard Fitzwilliams. We know how much it affected him. Uh, that's all I can say to that question. And indeed, he's gone into great detail about that, uh, the way it's affected his mental health. But that wasn't a suspicion. There's never, which is never mentioned of, um, of how, of the way she died. It was the effect that her death had on him at that age, which you can, of course, understand. And indeed, whenever he sees the click or hears the click of a camera, it still haunts him. So, of course, you know, that was a very um, terrible time. There's never a good time to lose your mother, but here he is on the cusp of adolescence. And of course, as a child of 12, walking behind his mother's coffin, I mean, at a funeral, it as a place in the nation's heart. Naturally, the death of Diana made an enormous impact on both of her sons. But perhaps because Harry was indulged more as a young child by his mother, perhaps because he never had the solid foundation of responsibility that gave structure to future King William's life, or perhaps even because some combination of these two things meant his father struggled to emotionally connect with him, Harry took his mother's passing especially hard. Stuart Pearce, who worked with Diana, and royal expert Kinsey Schofield believe there has always been a distance between Harry and Prince Charles. Well, Harry is Diana in male form. And so whenever he looks into Harry's eyes, I mean, I'm sure he loves him deeply, but he sees Diana and there must be remorse. There must be the vestiges of what we call it guilt. I don't know. I don't know. But he must feel the whole weight of the Diana crisis and then her, her eventual unbelievably lamentable death. So every time he sees Harry, he sees Diana. I think that she would be really proud of him for saying, I'm going to prioritize, I'm, I'm in love with this woman. I'm putting the love of this woman first. I'm putting my mental health first because all she ever wanted was for somebody to love her first and to put her first. And I don't think she ever had that 
She always wanted somebody to prioritize her, whether it was over the firm, whether it was over the royal family, whether it was over Camilla. She never was number one. And Prince Harry has made Meghan Markle number one, and he's made his family number one. And I'm sure she really admires that. The following year, Harry left for Eton College, the boarding school where his brother was already a student. While the princes were at school, the palace and the British press cut a deal where the media agreed not to report on their lives there, apart from the occasional stage photo opportunity. It gave Harry especially a bit of breathing room, but I do think it might have also reinforced his idea that the press was somehow the enemy. Let's remember that at this point, Harry and Will are motherless children. And they have a father who is described by many as loving and devoted, but he's also a father who was born in 1948. So they were being looked after by a variety of different people at different stages of their lives, but they didn't have a mother to sort of fret over them and keep them in line. So to an extent, Harry was checked by circumstance and by the fact that he was too young and we need to cut him slack for that. But he doesn't alter the fact that he was always going to be a problem because the surrounding was not fair. It wasn't long before that problem began to manifest itself in a string of scandals that left the palace at best embarrassed and, behind closed doors, furious. The first of these came in 2002, when Harry was just 17. So we learned in 2002 that Prince Harry had been caught by officials inside the palace smoking cannabis, and not just once, but regularly. It also emerged that, despite being underage, he was also drinking pretty heavily. Charles, his father, the Prince of Wales, got involved directly and said, I've been told, my aides have found out, I know that you've been dabbling in drugs and you've been smoking cannabis, and this is going to be a problem. It's not just the drink, it's the substance as well. After the press seized on the story, St. James's Palace was forced to issue a statement confirming that Harry had, quote, experimented with the drug on several occasions, but said that he was not a regular user. This story was leaked to the tabloids to the point where it was the news of the world reported that Charles himself organized a visit for Harry to a drug rehab in hoping that this would open his eyes, that it would be a short, sharp shock. Prince Charles said, look, my son needs help. And yes, I am heir presumptive, I'm heir to the throne, I'm the Prince of Wales, I have a family to look after. I have two boys to look after. How do I hit it home to my youngest that we don't turn to drugs, that we actually have charities to get people off of drugs? Harry was sent to visit Featherstone Lodge, a detox centre for heroin addicts in South London. And this is where Charles sent him to a halfway house to see the effects of drugs, to learn about this. Harry, if you continue down this path, you're going to be one of these people in my charities that are seeking my help to get onto a program to fix yourself. Now, either you can do it now with the help we're offering, or you can continue to go down this road and end up in this room with these people. And then what are you going to think of yourself? Forget what other people are going to think. What are you going to think about yourself? If sending his son to witness firsthand the devastation that drug addiction can cause seems an example of progressive parenting from Charles, for Thomas Mace Archer Mills at least, the fact that Harry was sliding off the rails at all was indicative of a greater problem in the royal family. When you look at what a member of the royal family, especially the British royal family, is going through as a young impressionable adult, if you're quote-unquote self-medicating using drugs and drink to sort an issue that should have been sorted from the beginning, such as the death of a parent, we have to look and say, oh, wait a minute here. Either the palace isn't doing what it should, the father, the remaining parent, isn't doing what he should, or Prince Harry is in fact not taking accountability and using the tools that are given to him and provided for him to better himself. Three years later, an even bigger scandal broke. 
In 2005, British tabloid newspaper The Sun splashed with a photograph of the prince at a fancy dress party wearing what was unmistakably a swastika armband. The headline? Harry the Nazi. There was a Halloween party where people dressed up and he chose to dress up as a Nazi in a Nazi uniform. Then there were pictures, of course, that got released. And so the famous tabloid headline is Harry the Nazi and he's in his uniform. And this was never a party that was supposed to have any photographers in attendance. But of course, when you're a member of the royal family, what you dress up as, even in private, even for fun, is probably going to end up in the headlines. Of course, this was just really stupid because of the fact that London and Britain was bombed to smithereens during World War II by Hitler and the Nazi party. It's yet another case of William having fun and Harry taking it slightly too far. I mean, dressing up as a, in a Nazi uniform is never, ever going to be excusable in the press. And of course, it was an intensely embarrassing moment for everybody. In response, the palace issued another statement, read here in full by an actor. I am very sorry if I caused any offence or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume, and I apologise. A poor choice of costume is certainly one way of putting it, especially as it happened just two weeks before the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, the concentration camp where more than one million Jews were murdered by the Nazis. At the Weissenthal Center, which is dedicated to Holocaust remembrance and combating anti-Semitism, they saw things a little differently. If he wants to disgrace the royal family by behaving in an abysmal manner, that's his business. But when he disgraces the memory of the Holocaust and disgraces the memory of those who gave up their lives to defeat Nazism, that becomes the business of the world to tell him that he has crossed the line, that it is unacceptable, and writing a prepared statement handed out by Buckingham Palace is an insufficient manner of dealing with this. So when you're wearing a Nazi uniform and, oh, you just happen to be snapped and you're all over the media for days and days, and then you come out with, quote unquote, I'm sorry if I've caused offense or embarrassed anyone. No, 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 that's too little too late. You've not embarrassed You've offended a country, you've offended a religion and its people, but it has shown your extreme ignorance as not only a member of society, but a member of the royal family that actually very narrowly escaped the clutches of Hitler himself. So what on earth was Harry thinking? You know, Harry just was not even thinking. He was clearly not thinking. He thought it would be funny. He literally dressed as a member of Rommel's Africa Corps. Big, big problem. But we also look at what William went as, and William dressed up as, as <laughs> a lion. Prince William went as a homemade lion. You know, the lions of England, yay, hurrah. Nowhere near anything as serious as a Nazi. For former Royal Protection Officer Ken Worf, Harry was not the only person at that party with questions to answer. He finds it astonishing that nobody thought, nor perhaps dared, to tell the young prince that he should in fact not dress as a Nazi. This was very bad timing. This was the 60th anniversary of the Holocaust. And it was bad timing. There's no way that Harry did that to offend the Jewish people of the world. He did it because he thought it'd be a fun idea. What I find very bad here is, I, why didn't his detective say to him, hey, Harry, this is not a good idea. You can't wear that. But they didn't, which is a shame to me because hey, it's easy to say this. If you as an individual working closely with somebody, but you see something that is intrinsically wrong and bad and likely to backfire, you have a duty to say, listen, I don't think this is a good idea based on this reason. He should have been told to take it off. Harry was barely 20 years old, but he had already become notorious not only as a hard-partying prince, but also as a rather loutish, insensitive man. It was a reputation his behaviour would only reinforce over the next few years. Jacqueline Roth explains. 
Between 2004 or 5 and 2007, Prince Harry seemed to be photographed stumbling out of nightclubs an awful lot, with the emphasis on stumbling. And he'd often be accompanied by young ladies. And here's the thing, if you look at those pictures, he's never smiling. He doesn't look happy. Harry was not only not smiling in the late night paparazzi pics, he was frequently very angry. And on more than one occasion, what the papers euphemistically described as a scuffle broke out between the prince and the waiting pack. So when he's leaving a nightclub, it was Pangea nightclub, in the throes of, I think, three, two or three in the morning, all of a sudden, you've got a drunken Prince Harry coming out. You've got the photographers that have not overtaken his pictures. What happens next depends on who you believe. According to Clarence House, Prince Charles' official residence, Harry feared for his safety after the paparazzi surged around him. But according to the photographers themselves, the prince lashed out at them. Thomas Mace Archer Mills is pretty skeptical about the palace's version of events. What Clarence House stated is that Prince Harry was defending himself when the incident occurred, but this incident left a photographer with a busted lip. And then it came out, well, oh, well, Prince Harry was hit in the face by the camera as the photographers crowded around him, and he just wanted to get into the car. But the account is not exactly as that is, because the photographer in question, Chris Uncle, actually said, wait a minute, that's not what happened. Prince Harry literally lashed at me. He got out of the car, pushed me, pushed the camera into my face, and... I'm hurt as a result of it. Nor was it an isolated incident. The same thing happened outside of another nightclub, where Prince Harry actually tried to punch and nearly did punch a photographer in the face. So there's something not right in knowing Prince Harry and his anger management issues as we do. Anyone who's there and can collaborate what that photographer was saying and then you have Clarence House putting out a statement where no one from Clarence House was there, then it becomes Harry versus all of these photographers. And if the photographers saw it and witnessed it and took pictures of it, who's telling the truth? Harry was still getting into trouble, and the palace was still having to put out statements excusing or explaining away his behaviour. For the firm, this was unacceptable. Here's Kenzie Schofield. Harry didn't have the same guidance or mentorship that Prince William did, but at the time they were doing everything in their power to try to squash those stories. In fact, you know, they would all of a sudden send him on some campaign where he's taking pictures with children. After he gets in trouble for something, you'd see the palace flip and try to send him on some PR campaign to get those great images that would remind people that Princess Diana was his mother and to forgive him for his behavior because they couldn't control him. Harry's hard partying lifestyle was one thing, but for Thomas Mace Archer Mills and Sally Otnes, the roots of his anger with the press are not exactly hard to figure out. The battle with the media for the royal family, but in particular Prince Harry, is he's never ever made any sort of excuse for his absolute hatred of the media. He's blamed the media for the murder of his mother, and we've seen him say, the same is happening with my wife, I'm not going to have it. To me, this just smacks of trigger. It's a trigger for that trauma. The British tabloids especially have a very um, established reputation for being ruthless and relentless, I think, in their pursuit of pictures. And I think if you look at the early pictures of Princess Diana, she was a teenager when they were chasing her down the street. And it was extremely overwhelming to her. And I'm sure that Harry grew up hearing his mother talk about the paparazzi and how annoying they were and at times how uh, resentful she was of their you know, constant presence. So I absolutely think that, and I, I think a lot of those occasions happened also when he, would, he had had a couple of, a few drinks coming out of bars, et cetera. So I think when his defenses were down and he felt like he was being pushed around, that was just not gonna fly with him. He's known to absolutely despise the media. He doesn't care what happens when he gets into that mindset, especially when he's under the influence of spirits. 
But what it comes down to is Prince Harry and his anger management issues, and also his hatred of the media, which when added to fuel the fire with all sorts of drink and spirits and out and partying and then not wanting to be shown in that condition, that's a recipe for disaster. Harry was spinning out of control, but as with his Shakespearean namesake, he was to find redemption in the army. He actually wanted to join the army after he graduated from Eton because he recognized that the structure would be a good thing for him. Prince Harry has always been a party person. The thing that saved him was his military career, but even that could only go so far. He liked the structure, he liked the fact that he could hang out and eat in what we would call here the mess hall with the regular, you know, with the regular unit and be a regular person. Harry had entered the Royal Military Academy of Sandhurst in 2005, shortly after the Nazi costume incident, and the following year completed his officer training and was commissioned as a second lieutenant. In 2007, his regiment was deployed to Iraq. When Harry's unit was sent to Iraq, there was some debate about whether he should be allowed to go with them or stay in safety, and he actually threatened to leave the army if he couldn't join his men on the front line. As it turned out, the head of the British Army, General Donat, disagreed, arguing that Harry's presence in a combat zone would actually put his men in greater danger. Or at least, that was the official line. In 2008, it emerged that Harry had been secretly deployed to Helmand Province in Afghanistan, seeing active service on the front line. So, when Harry entered the military in active duty, and when he was stationed in Afghanistan, the palace had a uh, big meeting with all of the press corps in Britain, or the powers that be that governed the press corps in Britain. And all parties agreed that the press corps would not try to find where Harry was stationed so that he could continue to serve. And that was great, and it worked for a long time. But then an American journalist who was not under that agreement actually was the one who blew his cover and therefore he had to be airlifted immediately out for the safety of the unit. And that, as I said, devastated him. This is where people don't stop to think as to how life as a royal actually affects you as a person. And you see the glamour, you see the Hollywood aspect, you see the celebrity, but there's a fine line between being celebrity and being royal. And this is where Prince Harry struggled and I think still struggles in his life. And when we saw that he wasn't able to go back to Afghanistan and he wasn't able to do what he wanted to do in Her Majesty's forces and be one of the lads and go in and do what he was doing in the military, that's where he was himself doing his purpose, his calling. That's what he enjoyed. But because the media leaked that he was there, it was no longer viable for him to be there. He could only be there if he was not known to be Prince Harry fighting on the front. And they ruined that for him. And that was hard for him because what's his purpose? What is Harry's purpose? And not only has the world asked themselves that, he has asked himself that. Despite the setback, Harry would return to Afghanistan for a second tour in 2012, flying Apache helicopters from the British Army base Camp Bastion. And finally, it seemed the wild youth had matured into a responsible young man. First of all, he just grew up because many adolescent males and females go through the drinking and, you know, smoking pot and running around stage. But the real growing up, I think, happened during his military service. Prince Harry at this time was seen as a bit of a hero. He was out there in Afghanistan fighting the Taliban, saving lives, risking his own life. It's an incredible turnaround from the partying and drunken fighting from just a few years before. The partying wasn't over quite yet, however. There was still one more excruciating embarrassment for the firm to deal with. And what happened in Vegas did not stay in Vegas. 
Now, pictures of a familiar looking man caught naked in his Las Vegas hotel room with a woman in a similar state of undress are of Prince Harry, St. James's Palace has confirmed. The pictures, believed to have been taken last Friday, were published on an American website. In August 2012, photographs were leaked of Prince Harry partying in Las Vegas while on leave from the army. And while that in itself may not seem so remarkable, the fact that the second son of the heir to the throne was naked and accompanied by several similarly adorned women very much was. We're looking seven, eight years down the road from his drug indulgence, from his Nazi party. Prince Harry has always had an attitude where I'm going to live my life, I'm going to enjoy the hand I was dealt, I'm not happy in the royal family. He's made no qualms about that, and he uses escapism. He likes to party, he likes to be in an altered state to where he doesn't have to deal with the reality of his life. What you need to understand here, it's not just naked in Vegas. I mean, this is someone who is the world's greatest bachelor. He is the biggest catch, a gay icon. Everyone was literally plastered to their newspapers that day because they saw Prince Harry's bum. Everyone was commenting on it. Just as had happened with the swash sticker armband seven years before, Prince Harry had fallen victim to an unguarded photograph. Given his mother's relationship with the paparazzi and his own fights with photographers, it was certainly ironic, to say the least. So when you're a member of the royal family, especially Prince Harry, when you've already made a name for yourself in the papers, those papers are going to pay a lot of money for any sort of picture showing you in a possible indiscretion. And that is what happened. So they say keep your friends close and your enemies closer, but in royal circles, it's very hard to distinguish between who's a true friend and who's a frenemy. That's, that's the difficult part of being royal, and especially somebody in Prince Harry's circle. That's the downfall of his life. And, just as with the infamous 2005 fancy dress photograph, former Royal Protection Officer Ken Wharf is astonished the picture was allowed to be taken at all. When you're a prince, the world is looking at you. And I've worked with American colleagues in this industry. What should have happened in Las Vegas? Yeah, invite the the ladies to the room, not a problem. But before you come in, let's have all your mobile phones. That's everything here, which we would do. You put them in the back. If you've got a problem at home, come and see me. You can use my phone, go outside and phone it. But there are no cameras in the air. And what happened in both events, so-called friends with their cameras, first of all, take a picture of Harry in a Nazi uniform and sell it to a national newspaper. And the same thing happened in LA. Somebody decided that I'll take a picture of Harry with no clothes on and sell that as well. Okay, it was wrong. Of course it was. But I do think, again, it's up to the people that are looking after these people to see the, 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 the frailties and say, you're not doing this, or if you're doing it, everybody that comes in gives me their mobile phone. While Harry's Las Vegas adventures certainly sold a lot of newspapers, and to be fair, raised a few smiles as well, for Thomas Mace Archer Mills, it was also another example of the prince's lack of respect for the institution he was born into. The palace didn't find it funny, his family didn't find it funny, and those that see the British monarchy, for example, for a contract of behaviour, certainly did not find it funny. So. Later on, in the days that actually matriculated into him going back from America, the royal household went into crisis mode. They were seeing that the royal brand could be put into disrepute by these sorts of actions of Prince Harry. And it wasn't just being photographed on a mobile phone. He had a necklace of ill proportion, of, of naked women and uh, literally hiding behind him in these videos and playing a game of strip pool just to have all these topless women around him showing a playboy sort of eccentricity and not having a care in the world really started to make people see something other than what they had always wanted to see. The firm once again went into crisis recovery mode and Harry was forced to apologise. Probably let myself down, let my family down, let other people down. But at the end of the day, you know, I was I was in a private area, and I sh- there should be a certain amount of pri- privacy that one should expect. Um, 
you know, back home, um, everyone, all my close friends, you know, rallied around me and, and were great. It was probably a classic example of me probably being too much army and, and not enough Prince. Except, being Prince Harry, even as he apologised, he couldn't help but have a swipe at his old enemy, the press. Yes, people might look at it going, um, you've got, you know, it's, it was letting off steam. It's all understandable now. You're going out to Afghanistan. Well, the papers knew that I was going out to Afghanistan anyway. So the way that I was treated from them, I don't think is acceptable. But hey. This is the million pound question, if you will. What's happened is that you can only have so many spin doctors. You can only have so many PR people working on something before they say, wait a minute, we don't know exactly what to do. We don't know how to handle the situation. We need to actually bring in other people. We need to get this boy some help. We need to get him a purpose in his life. After leaving the frontline service in 2014, Harry needed that new purpose, and he found it in the Inviticus Games, a multinational Paralympic-style sporting event for injured servicemen and women. With the full backing of Buckingham Palace and support from President Obama, the inaugural Games were a huge success, and once again restored Harry's standing with the British public and with the firm. The nation was very protective toward Harry because of losing his mother at such a young age and because he sort of seemed to have this um, streak that was just resembled Diana, compassion, but also a little bit of unpredictability. And he was always one of the members of the royal family who contributed to the charisma factor. But he is a good human deep down. He's trying his best, and like I said, I think he wants to make the world a better place. He is a lot, a lot, a lot like his mother. The defiance in him, the rebellion in him, these are all Spencer traits. Harry was also reportedly a favorite of the Queen herself. Here's former friend of Princess Diana, Stuart Pearce. It's really simple, because he's adorable. And secondly, because he's naughty. Well, and you know, Harry's a wild card. And he's everything that she would want to have been as a young woman. She couldn't. In July 2016, the rehabilitation of Prince Harry seemed complete. It was announced he had settled down into a serious relationship with an American actress named Meghan Markle. They were to announce their engagement in November of the following year, and on May 19, 2018, they married at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. Harry, the wild, riotous son of Princess Diana, who had for so long been a thorn in the side of the firm, had finally matured into a happy, responsible role model. Or had he? No, no, Harry is suffering from spoilt bratism and having been spoiled wrong by his mother and then indulged by everybody because his mother died young and the royal system has covered up for Harry's insufficiencies, the way they cover up for anybody else's insufficiencies, and the way the president of Coca-Cola's board would cover up for his insufficiencies until they were ready to get rid of him. It's called protecting the brand. We will take a closer look at just what Harry and Meghan did in a future episode. For now, let's just say that perhaps Harry never really stopped being his mother's son. Kinsey Schofield, for one, thinks Diana would be proud of Harry's current stance. I think that she would be really proud of him for saying, I'm in love with this woman. I'm putting the love of this woman first. I'm putting my mental health first because all she ever wanted was for somebody to love her first and to put her first. And I don't think she ever had that she always wanted somebody to prioritize her, whether it was over the firm, whether it was over the royal family, whether it was over Camilla. She never was number one. And Prince Harry has made Meghan Markle number one, and he's made his family number one. And I'm sure she really admires that. Next time on The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession, an unsuitable woman. You always have to have a villain in a fairy tale, right? It's hard to not see her as the villain in this story. And Camilla was indeed vilified. I mean, there's one notorious occasion when she got bombarded uh, when she attended a local supermarket outside London and her detractors bombarded her with bread rolls, which I, 
I mean, she obviously didn't expect that. The Firm, Blood, Lies and Royal Succession is a production of Audology, a division of Empire Media Group. The series is hosted by me, Jonathan Locke. Executive producers are Dylan Howard and Melissa Cronin. The series is written by Dominic Utton, reporting by Douglas Montero, mixing and sound design by Sean Kravitz. Please subscribe to The Firm wherever you get your podcasts, and if you like what you hear, leave us a rating, review, and tell your friends.